Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. We are live. Uh, as mentioned this morning, we're talking about cash flow uh, and what to do within your business as of today. Uh, I've got two guests with me. I'm going to just go and sort out some stuff on uh, sharing the video across, but can you start, Nate, with introduction and then Leiden, obviously, you follow up there as well. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, hello, hello. My name is Nate Ginsberg. Um, my company is Sellerplex and we help Amazon businesses with uh, finance and operation services. And uh, yeah, I can get into more of that later, but uh, I guess Leiden, over to you. <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Leiden Smithers. Um, uh, I've <laughs> Sorry. So, um, yeah, I'm director of a company called Ignite Brands. Uh, we run our own brands on Amazon. We're currently managing 16 accounts across different marketplaces um, and have joint, joint ventures with other people. Um, I'm also a mentor um, at China Magic, you might have heard of, with uh, alongside Danny, um, and then uh, a leader at, at a Titan Network. Um, but, yeah, looking forward to sort of maybe seeing if we can share some of the cash flow stuff that we've been working on um and see if we can help sort of settle some of the nerves around the cash flow and stuff in your businesses cool right i'm still setting up on this here but nate do you want to start underway obviously you've you've you put together some information we'll talk about the the basics of of the of the area of cash flow i mean a lot of people should know this but if we speed through that so if you want to go through your one sheet and just talk about yeah, uh, gross the, the and basics. net and stuff and then we can really uh, get into the the, the nitty-gritty and what to do with this stuff as well in terms of sure sure how to optimize so, yeah so before before the good stuff is yeah. um you, you got to get the the basics and so this is stuff that uh we work with a lot of businesses like when they want to be able to exit and like preparing to exit and it's a lot of similar things that that you're going to need to have in place um, to give yourself the best, like, you know, optics into your business to make the best decisions in, you know, times like these. And so, you know, the, the basics that you, you got to do that, like, is the foundation for any of the, you know, optimizations and savings and stuff that you can make is you got to have, uh, it starts with, you know, correcting complete bookkeeping. Um, and a tip on that is, is, work with somebody that has experience with e-commerce because a lot of a lot like e-commerce is tricky and if you're working with just like some random bookkeeper that isn't e-com experienced it's uh i mean it's it's much more likely that they could be doing things incorrectly and we work with different businesses where you know we'll we'll review their books when they want to you know when they're preparing for an exit and it's it's not uncommon that we see people that they've they've been doing things incorrectly, yeah. and this is problematic for a few reasons. Um, the same, I mean, if you want to have your if you ever want to sell your business, it needs to be done correctly. Yeah. But but more than that, and in these times, if you want to take on a loan, get financing, like you need to have your your books done, you know, completely and 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 again correctly is yeah. gonna like enable you to take on outside financing and and so getting that cool. in place let, let let's get into that there i think people got a general idea and understanding like we've set the scene and stuff let's get into because there's a lot of data that we need to go through let's get straight into it in terms of you know monthly revenue growth margins gross profit and then we can start to dip down into the other information cool uh Okay, so you want me to just go through that sheet? Yeah, if we can go into that. Sorry, look, I, I know we've what I'm trying to do here is we, we people are aware of what we're trying to achieve today. I want to get to the nuts and bolts for them of the the data we want to get across. Yeah, like there's some return on assets and and things like that. I want to give them the guys something really substantial to walk away with so they can implement that on their business today. Yeah, sure. So so I guess the the last thing before getting into that to just yeah. like hammer in is that yeah. you need to have your you need to have your books and financial statements first yes and make yeah. sure that's there and correct before you can get into any of that stuff so like 
you know, step number zero is, is making sure that's all done and done correctly. Yeah. After that, then, you know, stuff that, I mean, you know, in these times, honestly, it's, uh, you know, businesses don't go out of business because they aren't profitable. They, mm-hmm. they go out of business because they run out of cash and cash flow. Yeah. And so in times like this, that is, I mean, you know, more important uh, than ever is, you know, being aware and being on top of your cash flow. And I mean, can, can get into some suggestions of what, you know, people can or, or, or should be doing or where and stuff to look at. I mean, I'm, I'm having to, or I can still go through some of those different, you know, terms, but I don't know, yeah. you, you tell me where you want to go. Well, I think, right. So what we're looking at, a lot of the people that will be listening in now will run an Amazon business. They should know like net profit, gross profit and stuff like that. I think the key thing from today is, are they on top of their numbers? You know, with what's going on where there's so much uncertainty. Sometimes you just don't want to look at your numbers, right? You don't want to just like dive in. But what they want to know is, right, where can we save money here? Do you see where I'm coming from? Just coming straight in yeah, yeah. on those parts. Yeah. Right. Well, so, so I think you brought up a really good, uh, a good point. And one of the things that I wanted to cover yeah. is you're right that in, in times where it's more uncertain and, and things aren't going well, the tendency is you don't want to look at your numbers yeah. and, and that's actually the opposite and the worst thing that you mm-hmm. can do in a situation. Cause we, you know, we've all been there when business is good you know, refreshing sales every freaking five minutes. And then, you know, when things are on the downturn, you, you know, you, you don't want to look at it. And in times like these, like uh, clarity kills fear and like action kills fear. And so I know, and I mean, like, you know, this, this situation is hitting all of us in different ways. And, you know, with Sellerplex, we work with a number of businesses. Some of them are, are actually, and we were talking about earlier, some of them are thriving. Hmm. Others of them are not and sales are down and, you know, that impacts us in our scope and our work. And so, you know, everybody here is, is affected. And so the same exercises, you know, with my business, you know, my businesses, it's like, it's easy to just not you know, the tendency is to not look at the numbers when Mm. that's actually exactly what you need to be doing is Mm. not just looking at them, but, you know, looking at them even more regularly. And I mean, talking into getting into like, you know, cash flow projections and what those are and why everyone should be doing those. But, but like now more than ever, you gotta be, you know, aware of this stuff. Cool. Okay. So let's get into it. Let's get like everyone's got awareness now. Let's just talk hardcore. Let's go in. Let's give these guys some information. Uh, All right. Well, what I'd recommend the the first thing is you got to go through and so, okay. uh, First, a quick distinction between cash flow and profit. Mm -hmm. And so profit. uh, So profit is like, it's on your profit and loss statement, your P and L profit is, you know, revenue minus expenses equals profit. And so while that number is important, that's the number that your business is going to get valued off of. It's different than cash flow. And so, I mean, we've all, you know, I'm sure most or all Amazon sellers have been there. You know, you're selling all these products. Uh, sales are good. Revenue's good. You know, profit's good. But you look in your bank account and like, where's the money? And so that's the difference between profit and cash flow. And in these times, we need to do uh, everything to you know maximize and alleviate specifically cash flow because that's what's going to keep us in business. And yeah. so uh, the first thing that everyone should do is you got to go through your profit and loss statement, your P and L, and you gotta you know you gotta ruthlessly review. And so the first thing is, you know, the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest cuts you go through. If something is not absolutely necessary, or if something is not positive ROI generating. And so uh, those are the two things as you're going through, they need to be, you know, is this going to be, you know, is this an expense that you need 
or yeah. is this expense driving, you know, ROI? And yeah. if not, then, you know, first place to start is, is, you know, cutting expenses. Yeah. So for instance, cutting software, maybe freelance work that may be like additional work that doesn't give you a return on investment. Maybe there's some yeah. social media work. Um, yeah. Just a lot mm -hmm. of times just down to tools and, 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 and trimming back there. Um, yeah. Yeah. What would you do in terms of, would you suggest to do um, like a full cutback or would you look to review to say, okay, can we do this on a smaller budget over a small amount of time? So instead of completely getting rid of it, you reduce it. Uh, I, I guess I'd say it depends on, I mean, in these times, like a lot of, a lot of people are flexible. And I mean, you know, speaking from my business, working with our clients, like it, it's a very transparent, uh, you know, communication around like, you know, businesses that are hit. Like, I, I mean, as, as a service provider, we're not trying to, um, you know, we're trying to add value to our clients and not like stick them with an agreement that we have at, Think for we things love, and, and yeah. so the, the thing is i'd say with with your with whatever the expense i'd say to you know first like see if you can renegotiate so that's another option as a as opposed to just cutting yes um and so i'd explore that first hmm. uh i mean cut the stuff that's not necessary but but yeah re renegotiation can be really powerful yeah but, so no. something on that that I've um, no. accidentally got into this, but we've we've done it a few times now. And the reason I've accidentally got into it is because my business partner Dan Ashburn loses his wallet quite a lot, mm -hmm. and that part's connected to a lot of softwares and stuff. And when that seems to have happened, we've had to cancel all the softwares. And yeah. what's happened there is all the subscriptions we need to re sign up for them again. And we like to do that once every six to twelve months, and we cut everything and then sign up for all the stuff that we're actually using. And what that does is it's a very, a very small thing, but you'd be surprised about the things that you think you need, but you don't necessarily need with some of these subscriptions. And some yeah. of the stuff that slip under the radar if you haven't got the, got the numbers on there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, then just to come back and back up what Nate was saying there, 100% um, agree with the fact that you have to really understand your numbers. Yeah. Um, and I know that uh, in the beginning, when um, Dan and I first started out, it would seem that everything looks okay in terms of a bank thing, but without having that rolling 12 month projection, it's very difficult to see and um, see where you're gonna run out of money and where you're gonna drop below zero. So yeah. working in smaller amounts in one month to month to month or uh, quarter to quarter, you really need a long-term projection about when you're gonna be releasing a new product, um, when you need to pay your stock uh, deposits, when you need to pay the balance, you really need to have a good projection uh, for, for a long period of time. Otherwise, you will come unstuck with restock uh, orders and stuff like that. Yeah. Looking at what you have in the bank at any one time can look great. If you've got 100 grand in there, that could look wonderful. Um, there's only a few stock payments. All of a sudden, that's not there and you haven't got the money to restock. So again, yeah, understanding your numbers and, and having that long-term um, projection. Yeah. Um, yeah. If and then more, more boots on the ground with that. And we're coming back to like tracking numbers and stuff. I know a lot of um, people that are, I work with closely, they'll track their sort of sales um, product by product and their account on a, day, uh, on, a, on a weekly or monthly basis. Whereas with every account that we work on, we track daily. Um, and I think that just uh, comes down to, we've got a finger on the pulse 365 days a year rather than 52 weeks of a year. Um, and just really, you can't, Make sure you're tracking your numbers, keeping on conversion sessions um, and profit um, ad cost per unit and what you're spending on PPC there um, because you can't improve what you can't measure. Um, and we like, to, we like to track daily. That's, that's a big tip for me is like track your numbers daily and keep an eye on how things are going. You can quickly react to an overspend or, or, or not enough spend sometimes and, and just keep an eye on those numbers. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, just to uh, to echo that, uh, agree. Yeah, uh, so strongly. And so one of the things that you that you were saying that I think like honestly, if there's one, okay, if there's two things that that people can take away from this, the first is like we were saying before, you know, get know your numbers, get on top of them. The second is cash flow projections. And so the thing is in in times like these. Like I get it. It's, it's uncertain. 
You can be scared if you, you know, if you're going to be able to make your payments, you know, what the money's coming in, what's mo- what the money's going out and like clarity kills fear. And that's what you get with cash flow projections. And so, you know, the, the simple form, it's just a, 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 a chart tracking your cash inflows and cash outflows uh, over a period of time. And so you could do them for, you know, three months, six months, one year. Uh, I, I mean, I would recommend starting with at least, I mean, critical for, for sellers these days is I'd say starting at least with one month, hmm. preferably three months, but you start with, you know, one month, two months, whatever. And every one week or two weeks, you can track the money coming in and the money coming out. Yeah. And so you build out this chart. And the thing is, so you want to build it out today ASAP with your current assumptions about the business. And then what you need to do is every two weeks or every one week, you need to revisit that and update those assumptions to see where you're at. Because what, what those projections give you is it gives you clarity, which again, that's what kills fear. The, the uncertainty, the fear, it's all around, am I going to be able to make these payments? What's going to happen? Where am I going to Where? What's going to happen then? And you can really give yourself peace of mind by mapping this out for yourself. And so um, highly, highly recommend that. And, and then once you have that, we can then get into some of the stuff about like, you know, ways to, to, you know, improve your cash flow. Let's say you do your projections and four weeks from now or six weeks from now, you see that you're going into the red that gives you time to, to plan and to, to strategize on how to, you know, how to solve that as opposed to finding out the day before you need to pay a balance and you don't have the money. So, yeah. so yeah. Uh, well, I mean, a lot, of the, a lot of this is quite simple. I mean, I run free businesses. I've got a bookkeeper that keeps up to date, like just because of reconciliation and that, because sometimes you look to go and do a supplier payment and you think, shit, I'm not on top of my books. And you want to get on top of your books to know how much you've got on hand, like in the future, et cetera. So staying on top of that isn't a difficult thing if you've got like a bookkeeper doing it on a regular basis. And then sometimes it's not always, you know, I'll be the first to admit, I'm not like a cash flow king, but I have cash in bank. The reason I have cash in bank is because I'm not as good as optimizing cash flow and know every iota about it, of how to maximize every little um, little metric out of it. So I'm, I'm kind of keep it really simple. There's two things. It doesn't work necessarily on the inventory business, but there's two things. is months on hand and percentage of spend. Now, at a glance, as long as my sheets are up to date, I'm able to know where the business is, right? Just, but that's at a macro level at a glance. So I like to make sure I've got, you know, for me personally, on each of the businesses, I like to see that, you know, the ratio is 66% maximum. So there's always 33% or so left in the account. And I look to have six to eight months of cash on hand. That's always been my target. Now, I can easily go over there and easily spend, but then we get rainy days like this where, you don't know where the next move is coming from. So having cash in hand is important, but that's difficult when you run an inventory business because suddenly what looks your gross sales when you're seeing in seller central and what pops out of the (laughs) other end of your disimbursements, there's a lot there to untangle to stay on top of that, you know? Yeah. So, so with, with Amazon businesses, there are honestly like less levers that you can pull on in Mm. terms of improving your cash flow. That being said, there still are uh, there still are things you can do, and what we recommend is basically, you know, the most leverage is going to be attacking your biggest expenses first. And mm-hmm. so, biggest expenses, inventory, business. What's that going to be? Cost of goods. Yeah. And so, cost of goods. Um, you know, and again, the what you're trying to optimize for here for here is cash flow over profit. And so what you can do is honestly like have a, you know, have a transparent conversation with your suppliers and explain to them what the situation is and you can even show them. And so stuff that we help businesses with that we can, that can be really, really impactful is putting together. So the other side of cash flow projections are sales projections and, you know, good sales projections 
lead to the cash inflows. And so, you know, they're, they're, they're both very intertwined. And the point of having good, one of the benefits of having good projections is you can then take those to your vendors and set and show them be like, look, you know, it's like being transparent, being communicative, like here's our situation. Um, this is how, you know, these are the orders that we're going to need to make or that we want to make. This is the timeline. And, you know, when you're able to show them more of the bigger picture of what your plans are, that is going to give you an advantage and get, make it more likely that they are willing to then work with you. And for example, grant you, you know, extra payment terms with, I mean, when they are able to understand what, you know, what's going on in your business. And so I'd say the, the, the first thing that you, you know, want to attack, I mean, the easiest thing to cut is, you know, software, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. But like the most impactful is going to be cost of goods. And so, you know, talk to your suppliers, you know, getting later payment dates, like be honest with them. They don't want you to go out of business either. And so uh, I was say, fact, going on the supplier uh, payments live, do you want to step in here as well? Because you do a lot of stuff in and around supplier payments. Even some points you're getting it after the goods have landed, aren't you? Do you want to walk through some of the tactics you can use? Yeah, of course. So, um, yeah, as you know, Danny, we do a lot of work with supplier payment terms. We're big on, on cash flow when it comes to inventory management. Um, and of course, you've got all these options. You've got bank loans, you've got uh, credit cards that you can use and uh, to, to order um, to order stock to make sure you don't run out and order bigger, bigger orders so you can launch into new marketplaces. Um, but um, what we like to focus on is supplier terms. Uh, and that's always our first point of call. And it's my favorite because a lot of the time it's free. So all bank loans and any more borrowed money has a fee um, attached to it, whereas um, supplier payment terms don't. Um, so when approaching um, a, a, a Chinese supplier, let's say, when approaching a Chinese supplier, I know a lot of people that have tried to do this before, send an email off saying, can I pay a little bit later? And normally what happens is they send an email back saying, no, we need the 30%, 70%, which, which most people on uh, listening in will be used to. Um, whereas what we do, we take a slightly different approach. Um, and what we need to do is paint a picture of what the long-term relationship looks like. Um, and it needs to be a win-win for both sides. So without that, taking a step back to what we were talking about earlier on cash flow projections over a period of time, without, without that cash flow projection, you don't understand your numbers, you don't understand the terms that you need. Yeah. Um, and, and again, like Nate said there, it starts with a sales projection, projection. So the way that we would approach it is work out a sales projection and work out how much cash you're going to have on hand so you understand the terms that you're going to need uh, and then create a win-win. Um, and we've sort of developed over time um, a six-step process. Uh, and what we like to do is, so step one is like the growth potential. What we like to do is show previous um, sales and the previous growth of the business. You can use screenshots from um, uh, Sell Essential, use, use your numbers and show how far you've come to date by, by working with this supplier and the partnership that you've created with them. Um, and I say partnership very strongly because that's what we're looking for. We're not looking just to buy stock from the, the supplier. We want to create a partnership. Um, so we show how far we've come so far. Um, show the sales forecast. Show you're not plucking numbers out of the sky like, like they'd be used to with a lot of other people. Um, and then we sort of show what that, what to fulfill that forecast, this is how many units we're going to need to make sure we don't run out of stock, to make sure that we continue to grow the business, which is gonna be helpful for both sides and a win-win for both sides. Yeah. Um, and then what we do is we, we show the before and after. So yeah. with the current terms that we've got, this is, this is how many units I can order from you. Yeah. However, you can see that this is my projected growth. If you can give me these better terms, um, then this is what we can order. Yeah. Um, and then another thing that is really worth explaining to your supplier, what we've found, which, which, is, which is strange, is what out of stock means for them. So a lot, of, a lot of the time, the supplier will say they're out of stock, which means they're going to be calling me, they're going to be on Skype, they're going to be sending emails, it'll be very, very annoying. Um, that's what they associate with be, you being out of stock. Yeah. However, you need to explain to them that if, they're, if we're out of stock, it means they're losing out on sales as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just us being annoying. So... Yeah. A lot of the time what we need to do is try and order extra stock to sort of to, to, to fill that gap. And the way we do that is, is for asking for better terms. Yeah. And so they're going to look on your velocity anyway. For If it's the same supplier, they're going to know what you sold before. Exactly. If you've been around with them a while, they're going to know the seasonality, how many times you turn inventory and stuff like that. So what 
what do you try and negotiate for? Like, so normally it's the, you know, not everyone does this, but it depends on the level of seller you are and the relationship you got. It's normally 30, then 70%, isn't it? With a bit of lead in. So yeah. what, what are you negotiating for? Are you literally getting it into the UK or the US before you make the first payment? Talk me through some of the results that you've achieved from that and what people can do themselves. Yeah, so some of the, the, the ones that we've achieved, the, the best one that we've achieved is a 0% deposit. We've gone from 30% deposit, 70% before shipping. We've got yeah. a 0% deposit and 100% 60 days after shipping, meaning that that stock, if we're shipping by ocean, which mm. is another way to save cash flow, not spending yeah. a load on, of money on air, on air. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're getting that in and we've got 30 days worth of sales on that stock before we even have to pay for any of it. Any of it. Mm. Um, and then... We always go for that. We always go for maybe a 10% deposit um, and, and a 90% 90 days after. Yes. Yeah. When, when you speak to your suppliers, they're not going to want that. They want to negotiate and sometimes you'll meet somewhere in the middle. So I've got a little bit longer than what we need and then hopefully we'll get somewhere need uh, somewhere what, what, where what we need. Um, and we end up with situations where um, before we've had 30, 30, 70 and we've got a 20% deposit, a 35% 60 days after shipping and a 45% uh, uh, 90 days after shipping. Yeah. And each supplier will be different. So the same way we have cash flow issues, so do they, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they have different situations. You've got a small company, the small factory that's a uh, family run out in, out in, the, out in the sticks. They're, gonna have, they're not going to have the capacity to, to help you as much as maybe a bigger, a bigger company would. Yeah. So you need to sort of understand that. And I find that trying to understand the exact process of how your product's made um, and how it actually reaches you will, will help you um, figure out what they can do for you. For example, we've, we've tried to get a lower deposit down on, on one of them. They weren't willing to do the lower deposit simply because the cost of the raw material costs 30%. So yeah. I'm, I'm willing to give them the 30% so they're not out of pocket. But then what I want their help with is uh, a 60 or 90 days after shipping to, to, um, to do that. So each situation is different and you just, it's, it's really more about really understanding the process of how your product's made um, and what their, their own cash flow needs are as well. Yeah. Makes it. Uh, Nate, do you want to yeah. Just to, uh, to, yeah, yeah. I just want to say, um, you know, again, uh, totally agree. And I think the, some, you know, key things that people should take from that is, you know, approaching this with your suppliers, like they're, you know, they are your partners and, you know, just like in any type of negotiation or deal making, it's, it's looking for the win-wins. And so, I mean, looking for the win-wins and when you're presenting it, you know, showing them why this is better for them, not, not presenting it like, Hey, I have cash flow problems. I need better terms, but, uh, you know, explaining to them, you know, if you can help me with this, this is how it will benefit you. And this is why it's better for you. And so always thinking of it, uh, how to win friends and influence people. One of the uh, highly recommended books. Um, but yeah, it talks about just that, about making it about them and why it's good for them and yeah. focusing on that. And, um, and then just the, the, the last thing that you also said that I thought was, I mean, is super on point is, uh, you know, just really finding out what the actual situation is like in terms of, you know, what, uh, what the factory situation is and with the process of getting your products made and what and when they need the money, because yeah, understanding is as clear of an understanding as you can have of what their, you know, cost and payment structure and needs are the mm -hmm. best that you'll be able to, you know, propose something that they get what they want and then you also get you want. And so, yeah, really important in, in working together with them. Cool. Yeah, and just, uh, to, just to add to that as well, um, we're talking about, we're talking a little bit about pricing and stuff earlier as well. And what I find with most people is that I want the lowest possible pro price for my products and I want the lowest possible cogs. Having cash flow so that you don't run out of stock, so you can ship by sea instead of air, so that you can launch into a new marketplace so you can launch a new product is much more important than trying to take four three two three four percent on the profit so in certain cases when i i never offer it up front but when i haven't been able to get the exact terms that i want to make sure i don't need to borrow money from the bank or mm. or seek other other financial help um i will offer to pay more per unit to uh, to achieve those terms because cash flow yeah. is king and that is what's going to allow you to grow 
Um, yeah. So you, I will sacrifice a small piece of profit per unit sold on a certain product to make sure we, we've got that cash flow and, and we're comfortable. Cool. Yeah, and uh, uh, totally agree with that as well. And just to, to um, expand on that a little bit, it's a lot of times, you know, like uh, cost of goods and payment terms are sort of like, you know, different levers. And I mean, ideally, you, you know, as a seller, you want low cost of goods and, uh, you know, no down and net 90. But, you know, realistically, again, we're talking about working with factories as partners. It's like, you know, you, you give a little, get a little. And so, um, you know, totally agree that uh, a lot of instances, it's better to like give on the cost of goods side, if that's going to allow you then to get better, you know, better payment terms. And in approaching that and telling the, you know, maybe you like first ask for lower cost of good, you know, you show them your, your nice sales projections and you, you ask for lower cost of goods and then, you know, zero down net 90, but then you can retract on the cost of goods if that's going to, you know, still let you keep the, the better payment terms. Anyway, the point is there's, you know, two levers that you can kind of play with. And, and in times like these, especially, I think you got to prioritize cash flow. Cool. So we've, we've, we've identified that. So basically we've covered inventory, we've covered softwares. Um, where else can we optimize credit cards, air miles? I know that's just frivolous, but you know, is there any way that people can use credit cards right at this moment to their, to their advantage? Do you want to jump on that or? Yeah. So we were talking about this the other day um, and something that we're looking to do is use rather than have the, our PPC spend come out of, um, uh, come out of the, the money's earned within Amazon, you can use certain rewards cards. And whether that be yeah. air files or cash back points, yeah. there are there are cards that you can use. It's definitely worth looking into to help get cash back. And that would just save some money money there. Um, yeah. and while we're on the subject of PPC, um, when I take a look at people's uh, accounts and cash flow, I see that as one of the biggest... Um, uh, the, the biggest drain of, 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 of uh, cash flow and something yeah. that short of flying to China and sorting out uh, terms of your supplier or, or jumping on Skype, something you can do immediately is focus in on your, on your PPC and make sure that you're not overspending there. This yeah. all comes back to obviously tracking your numbers daily and working out what those metrics are. Uh, mm -hmm. We tend to work on uh, three metrics when we look at our PPC. Um, and we played with different numbers, but the, the three numbers that we tend to, to work on are 30, 10, and 25. Um, so an average of 30% uh, ACOS on PPC sales. Um, depending on your profit margins, that normally makes them around break even, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then we look at true ACOS um, or ad cost per unit, as, as we call it, uh, which is all of your sales, um, at how much uh, compared to the amount of money you spent on, uh, on PPC. And we yeah. like to keep that around 10%, um, which is the same as uh, bricks and mortar stores, right? You're willing to reinvest 10% of revenue into a marketing contribution, uh, into advertising. Um, and then the third one is, um, and this all comes down to your ratio between um, PVC sales and organic sales. So we like to keep 75%, if possible, of our sales coming through organic mm -hmm. um, and 25% coming through PVC. Yeah. And what we found is that sort of trifecta there, holy trinity of those three numbers is what keeps us the balance of enough spending on PVC to keep us, uh, keep us ranked um, without spending too much. Um, and the majority of sales coming through um, organic rather than uh, PVC, meaning that 75% of our, our products sold are, uh, are all profit. Um, and, then, and then only 25% come through PVC. So yeah. they're the three sort of numbers we tend to focus on, but it's very easy to pile money into, into PPC to keep that revenue up um, and, and sort of not be focusing on the profit rather than, rather than revenue. And that's something that I've found when, when we're taking a look at people's accounts that, um, that, that we sort of found. Yeah. So and would you say, is there any advantages as well? If you're using your card to pay for your PPC to contact support and ask them to up your limit? So instead of tapping your card a couple of times a month, depending where your limit's at, is increasing your limit so it taps your card further down the line just to give you a little bit of space. So do you mean a limit on the card or? Limit, you know, when you get, when you run your PPC, yeah? yeah. It has to charge your card. So yeah. basically you hit a limit and then your Amazon will charge your card. What about yeah. if people were to contact support and see if they can up the limit on their PPC 
So instead of being charged maybe twice a month or how many times, depending on what they're spending, is they up their limits so they get charged on the card, say a later part of the month, buying them a little bit more time. That makes that makes a lot of sense. That's not something I thought of. So thanks for that, Daniel. Yeah. Make a note of that. But yeah, I didn't yeah. realize you could do that. Speak to Amazon. Uh, so they, well, they, not everyone knows about that, but there's uh, something that you can try. It doesn't mean it's guaranteed that you're going to get the result that you want. But I know that people. That. No, it's a very good yeah. tip. I like that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, another one on that, or just of like cards. Um, so what what we recommend, and what are some really really awesome, um, I guess yeah, financial uh, you know products. I think um, I mean I know it's available in America. I I think it's it's also available in 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 Europe. But one is um the the Brex card. And so this card is, is really cool. It gives you a uh, 0%, um, you know, 0% interest on your charges for 60 days. So really, really powerful with that card. You can just add 60 days to your payments and the thing and like, uh, so you have Brex is the, the zero day or 60 day zero interest credit card. And mm-hmm. then you can pair that with this other, uh, this other tool called plastic with yep. a queue and um, with plastic that allows you to make your payments. It basically allows you to, to charge any payment on a credit card. Yep. And so with Brex, with plastic, that can really boost your cash flow, potentially giving you 60 extra days on your inventory payments, which, you know, can really, can really change the business. Definitely. Well, look, I'm, we're coming up to about the 40 minute mark now. Um, we're going to have to wrap in about five or so. Is there any other key things you want to cover for the audience? And does the audience have any questions for us as well? I know a few people have said hi, but it's I'm not sure. I'll wait for questions there. I think one key thing is for people looking to launch new products, I would, um, a lot of the times when we're looking through products and seeing if they're viable or not, we're looking at profit. Um, but if we can dial that back and look at ROI, yeah. that will help us with our cash flow as well. So we tend to focus on looking at products that will give us 150% ROI. Um, not always possible, but as close to that as we can, we can get. Because uh, yeah. what we want to do is once we've sold a, sold a unit, we want to be able to buy, uh, cover the cost of that unit and buy another unit and cover the cost of the, the sort of running cost of, of, of selling it. So by, by taking a look at ROI rather than profit, um, which I'm sure a lot of people do, but maybe some don't, is, uh, is try and keep, we've found the sweet spot to be around about 150% ROI which sort of as with, with the right sales velocity sort of keeps you, keeps you above water and you're not sort of investing too much into, into stock to make a profit, but, but not give you enough to reorder type thing. Yeah, sounds good. Anything you want to add, Nate? Uh, just, I mean, that like on, you know, the emphasis on, on ROI. And so, you know, with any product that either, I mean, you're launching or you're currently selling just like, you know, now in, in, in these days, more important than ever to be aware of and focusing on that return and like not running extra PPC spend. And now your margins are nothing, or you're even not profitable on things like now is not the time to be doing that. And, you know, thinking of launching new products, like being really just like really knowing your numbers and knowing what your costs are and, and making sure that you have margins so that you're able to you know, reinvest profitably with that, with that product. Um, and it's not just eating up your cash. So cool. Um, yeah. Sounds good. I just want to say a thank you to everyone who's listening in the different groups. Um, amazing FBA group, Amazon memes. Uh, where else are they? They are in sourcing with Kian, seller chatbot. Thank you for everyone that's been joining today. Guys, what's the best way they can reach if they want to reach out? uh can find me nate at sellerplex or uh nate ginsburg instagram facebook um yeah happy to chat with anyone um and here to help cool uh and for yourself lyden yeah lyden's with us on facebook i'm in a lot of the groups that are already on there so uh i've got a pretty strange name if you search my name on facebook lyden's with us i'll I'll probably pop up or email hello at lydensmithers.com Sounds good, guys. Thanks for joining us today. I'll be back again tomorrow. And, well, we're back seven days a week. Uh, and whilst we're on lockdown, tomorrow we're going to cover international lockdown. I've got a, a load of women from the industry that are going to come on tomorrow from different countries and talking about their experiences over the last couple of weeks with what's been going on since we got back from Prague. 
Uh, Sunday, we'll be doing another one, but on Monday, Sunday's not defined yet, but on Monday, we're going to be doing a big PPC uh, round table for you guys what to do in the current climate. Then Tuesday is going to be on ranking. Then on Wednesday, I'm bringing in Howard Ty, and we're going to be discussing uh, how to protect yourself in terms of black hat for everyone in the community. So thank you so much for joining me today. And the guys, thank you for gracefully for giving up your time. I'll see you again uh, tomorrow at 4pm. If you need anything, just hit me in the inbox. Take care. I'll see you soon.